Some things are going on this week that answered, that asked the question, why? Well, the Lord wouldn't lay this in my heart. So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. If you're using the Bible in the pew, I think it's 1032. I picked up the Bible. It looked, didn't look like it was like the rest of the Bibles. I hope that that's the same as the Bible you're using. Page 1032. Get you to Second Corinthians chapter 12. How's that work? No? Obviously, I'm going to get rid of that one. And that will be available for a vacation Bible school. All right. I don't know where that one came from. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 12. When you find it, you can stand, stretch a little bit. Get you stretched a little bit because some of you have been sitting for a while. Did you find it? Verses 1 through 10. What was the page? 1208. 1208. All right. All right. The Apostle Paul is speaking. First few verses talks about his vision. He had a paradise or heaven. And then the remaining part of the verses from 7 through 10 talk about his thorn in the flesh. And so the first few verses will see his vision in heaven. It begins this way. It's not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I can't tell. God knoweth such a one caught up to the third heaven. Of course, he's referring to himself. And I knew such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I can't tell. God knows how that he was caught up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words which it's not lawful for a man to utter. Of such one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Heavenly Father, I feel that you've laid this in my heart to share with your people today. Lord, some have asked why. Why is this happening in my life now? I've served you all these many years. Why are all these things happening in my life? And so I pray, help us to understand your word. Give us understanding of suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shake hands with someone before you're seated. You wanted to get, put me to the test. Uh, you brought a windstorm through and brought a branch down about as thick as my arm, and out of nine mailboxes, it smashed mine. <laughs> Just mine. <laughs> oh, I mean, it smashed it so flat, I had to bend it to get my mail out. Knocked it clean off the railing. <laughs> That's minor compared to things that we go through, isn't it? That's minor. I'm going to share something else. It's probably what prompted this message. I'm looking at the date on the message. The last time I shared it was June 7th last year. 
I stopped at the paint store this week to pick up some paint for a dear lady I want to start next week, paint her whole house. And uh, most of the people I've dealt with through the years are either gone or retired. And they've all been replaced with new people. So uh, when I went into the store this week, I asked them, where's Steve, where's Ben? And one of the new employees said, well, Ben's here. And Bert, Ben here heard my voice, because I often would talk to him. He's a man, he was a manager of Sherwin Williams' store for many years. And he popped his head out of the office, and I looked at him, and he had such casual clothes. You know me, I said, well, Ben, it looks like you don't got work clothes on. You got your pajamas. You just need a pair of bedroom slippers to go with that. And I said, are you retired? He said, yeah. I said, well, you're too young to retire. He's younger than I am. And then he walked over to the counter to me and said, I buried my wife a year ago, and I had to take retirement early. Oh, as usual, Roger opened his mouth and put his foot in it. I said, well, tell me how did that go? He said, not very well. I never knew that Ben uh, was used as a Gideon speaker. He traveled and did Gideon speaking engagements. He always was a very cheerful man, and every time he went in, he was always smiling. Just a wonderful man to talk to. And then I started talking to him about his, his uh, spouse. He said, yeah, about a year ago. I said, well, how did she go? Well, she had cancer. He said, I, I held her hand for three hours after she passed till her hand was the only one part of her body. I said, was she mad at God? He said, I was for a while. Did you get rid of any of her things yet? He says, no, still have everything yet. I, he said, I, I spray some of her perfume in the house sometimes just to be reminded of her. You think? How would your life be changed when your spouse is gone? And some of you know what I'm talking about. It's different, really different. Will some of us experience it? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. So how do you handle grief? Everybody handles grief differently. I've heard of some spouses that their loved one's been passed away now for mm, 10, 15 years. And they still haven't been able to remove the clothes from the closet. None of us here know how we would respond to that, do we? You ever sit alone at your house when your spouse is gone? Ever been, how many of you ever been alone? Just for, just for a while. Did you ever think about how that would be continuously? Yeah. I did. What if your spouse never came back through those doors? Would your life change? Probably quite a bit. A dear Christian woman wrote this heart-rending letter to a pastor. In 1972, we lost a Down syndrome son to pneumonia. He was just 17 months old. Seven years later, in 1979, we lost our 15-year-old son. He was electrocuted in our backyard while climbing a tree. Now our 24-year-old son has diabetes, and I have cancer, and I'm going through chemotherapy, and I ask you sincerely, 
Is it a sin to ask God why? Does he understand our humanness? She goes on to, to say, Pastor, have you ever been angry at God for a season? I have, and I know it's wrong. I feel ashamed for having such thoughts. But I get so confused trying to understand why Christians suffer so much. I know we are no more deserving than others. But I'm shocked at all the suffering we're enduring. I have fear and anxiety. But I want to replace all my fears with a strong faith in spite of my suffering. Still, I keep asking, why so much suffering? How long will it go on? We can only imagine this morning the horror of finding a son or a daughter lying on the ground dead after having been electrocuted. I understand this mother's cry. Why did I have to bury another son? Why are two of our boys dead with another one afflicted with a deadly disease? I have cancer. I'm sick from radiation and chemotherapy. We've all been struck. Why all the suffering? When will it end? You ever ask yourself those questions? I can't explain, nor will I try to explain, why this particular family has endured such great afflictions. Have you ever wondered yourself when you hear about terrible things that some families it seems like it never ends and their plate is entirely full of problems? I can tell you this, it's not a sin to ask why. Our blessed Lord asked this question as he hung in pain on the cross. He was called a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 53 and verse 3 said, I believe our Lord understands all of our questioning. I believe he knows how to relate to our anguish. He hears us when we cry, Lord, why are you putting me through this? I know it doesn't come from your hand, but yet you have allowed the devil to harass me. Why do I have to wake up every day with this dark cloud that's hovering over me? Why do I have to endure such pain? When will this nightmare end? You see, the world demands explanations for pain and suffering in this life. There's many of non-believers that have asked me, if your God is real, if he's truly loving as you say, why does he allow starvation to continue? Why does he allow floods and famines to ravish these poor nations, wiping out thousands at a time? How can he stand by as AIDS kill millions in Africa? Why are thousands being annihilated in war-torn countries that have never known peace? Reverend, I have a hard time believing in your God. 